Um, I'll probably introduce Adele. Uh, he's going to be going through his presentation around uh, profiling clustering internet wide scans with FAT. Is that FAT or FAT? <laughs> um, so I'll hand it over to Adele um, if you want to make your way up. Can we give him a, a very warm welcome? Thanks. Hello everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, going to present my uh, latest research about the profiling and clustering internet wide scans uh, with a new tool I released a couple of days ago. So uh, let's first uh, introduce myself. I'm a lead security engineer at Salesforce in detection team, and also a member of the INET project for about 10 years now. Uh, Co-developer of hash profiling method, which is uh, the profiling method for SSH. I'm going through that uh, in a few minutes. And uh, been working on a couple uh, more open source projects you can find in my GitHub. So I'm going through some uh, basics about the fingerprinting and uh, different protocols. Uh, then jumping into uh, how I monitor internet-wide scans and uh, how could we improve uh, doing that and then introduce my new tool FAT and then uh, the most interesting part of the talk which is uh, the observations. So uh, these are the main uh, questions I'm trying to answer uh, through the presentation. So could we actually uh, profile the attackers using the network metadata and fingerprints? Could we identify their tools and maybe discovering new connections, hidden connections which we couldn't find before, having network metadata and fingerprints which is like a bit of more context? And possibly maybe we can uh, detect new evasion techniques as well. So I had these questions in my mind uh, before starting doing this uh, research. And uh, now I'm going through some uh, background stuff and then uh, present the main research and we will see the answers to these questions. So before we start, uh, we need to know a bit more about uh, fingerprinting techniques. Uh, there are lots of them with different use cases uh, for example, you all know about uh, OS fingerprinting or TCP IP stack uh, fingerprinting, which, for example, you can do using NMAP or POF, passive OS fingerprinting. Uh, there are other types of fingerprinting as well. For example, browser fingerprinting, you can fingerprint the browsers and even the users itself uh, by having a look at things and features like uh, systems, fonts, uh, languages, and stuff like that. But uh, there are another type of fingerprints which is focused on identifying the clients and applications for different protocols, mainly cryptographic protocols like SSL, SSH, and RDP. Uh, for example, I guess you've heard about JAW3 or fingerprint TLS and hash. These are actually based on the fact that cryptographic protocols need to negotiate some protocol, uh, some parameters in clear text. So it doesn't matter which uh, cryptographic protocol you use, SSH, RDP, TLS, they have to negotiate some parameters at first. So let's see uh, how could we fingerprint the connections uh, using these uh, parameters we have in clear text. I'll start with uh, TLS because uh, my main focus in this research was on TLS, and then I uh, expanded to uh, RDP and other protocols as well. But uh, we have a bit uh, more details here about TLS. So for TLS, uh, the interesting packet and message for us is the client hello. You can see here uh, is a sample uh, it's actually a simplified version of a uh, message flow for TLS handshake. Uh, and the first packet you see here is client hello, which is important for us. We currently don't care about the rest of 
messages here, but basically how it works is uh, clients send the algorithms like the cryptographic algorithm, encryption algorithm, compression, and uh, extensions it supports and everything else uh, using the client hello to server. Server uh, responds back with server hello and selects one of these uh, algorithms and then uh, the rest of negotiation happens, which is uh, key exchange, certificate exchange and stuff like that. This is uh, the structure of client hello based on the RFC, which I uh, linked under the page. So what you can see here is there is protocol version, a random a string, uh, session ID, cipher suites, compression methods, and extensions. But things which are interesting for us are these four fields. We don't care about the random string. We don't care about the session ID because these, these, these are the things which can be changed during the session or uh, depending on different clients and connections. So we can't really use those for fingerprinting. So the thing is, the cipher suite list and uh, uh, the cipher suite list we have in client uh, hello message is actually in order of client's preference. So each client application may have different uh, preferences and different combination of these uh, with uh, supported extensions. Uh, uh, compression algorithm and if, um, other parameters in the client hello can help us uh, having some kind of uh, fingerprints. So theoretically, we can have some unique fingerprints for uh, applications, but when you look at it in uh, real life, the thing is uh, there are many applications using the same version of the same, uh, for example, TLS library, Open, open SSL or something like that. And uh, as a result, they have the same jaw tree. So you may see different applications with the same jaw tree, which is fine. So a bit of history on this uh, TLS fingerprinting thing. The first thing uh, actually I found was a work by uh, Ivan Ristik. Uh, from SSL Labs, and uh, it was actually an Apache module for uh, just debugging purposes, which was uh, logging the initial SSL handshakes and uh, just focused on the cipher suites, nothing else. And uh, it was extracting and logging that. So one of the use cases, as I said, was for debugging, but another use case was for cross-checking the supported software suites with HTTP client uh, user agents. So uh, the purpose was to find if uh, there's any bot or scanner or uh, tool trying to fake the user agents. And then if we check that uh, using the support, uh, supported software suites, the kind of uh, fingerprint, we can uh, actually detect that. So this was the main purpose of uh, creating this uh, mod SSL half. After that, uh, I found the, the, the unofficial module for POF, uh, which you can see here is a sample of the fingerprints they have. It's a bit ugly, but uh, better than the, the previous one because uh, it's not just based on the software suites. It includes other parameters in the client flow as well. But this is just an unofficial one, which isn't merged with the main uh, POF code base. The next major thing was uh, in 2015 done by uh, Lee Brotherstone, uh, which he created a couple uh, scripts and tools for matching, creating, and exporting of uh, TLS fingerprints. Uh, you can see here is the uh, comp composition he used for creating his own uh, fingerprint, which includes uh, different things, not just the software suite. It includes the TLS version and compression and uh, uh, elliptic curve as well. So uh, the thing is, uh, he actually uses a binary format for the database. And uh, what you can see here is uh, the export of that uh, database into JSON format. 
uh, it's uh, really good, uh, better than the previous works. But again, uh, it's a bit hard to share uh, these fingerprints with the community and uh, have some kind of detections based on that. So that's why uh, two of our guys uh, from our team in Salesforce started uh, working on Jotree, which is uh, currently the most uh, common SSL fingerprinting method. Uh, the composition of the parameters we used for fingerprint is almost the same as the fingerprint TLS. Uh, and the thing is we put all these things together and hash it with MD5. So it's easier to uh, share and uh, implement it on different devices and tools. And currently, uh, many tools in the community started uh, adopting these, like uh, Surikata, Bro IDS, and uh, many other tools, even uh, Packet Beat, uh, and many different tools uh, out there started supporting this. So let's uh, move on to the next protocol, SSH. And uh, then we go back to TLS again. Uh, so for SSH, uh, we actually have a message called uh, SSH message checks init, which is a key exchange initiation. And uh, as you can see here in the screenshot, there are some fields like algorithms, key exchange algorithms, encryption, MAC, compression, and language, which uh, potentially can be used for fingerprinting. We actually started working on this uh, several months ago. It was late uh, 2018. Uh, ben Riden and uh, me started working on this and uh, had an initial composition, tested on that on our honeypots and different scenarios. and. Uh, removed some uh, parameters from the final uh, composition because they were a bit dynamic. We couldn't use those uh, for fingerprinting. And then uh, the final composition is uh, what you can see here. Key exchange, algorithm, encryption algorithms, MAC, and compression. Uh, we put all these things together and hash it in MD5, almost the same way as uh, we do it in JAW3 for TLS. And uh, then we have hash for client SSH applications and hash server for uh, SSH servers. Just another uh, point here. Uh, before this uh, checks in it message, you can see uh, there is another uh, uh, negotiation called save server identification string and client identification string. This is actually something which you can easily change. Uh, but by default, if you have a look at like the open SSH clients uh, or servers, they have a specific uh, a string here. For example, you can see here, uh, let me use the magnifier. So this is, for example, for a specific version of SSH on Ubuntu. And uh, you can easily change this. For example, if you have used the Nmap, the SSH scanning module in Nmap, you can easily change that, but uh, most of the times no one changed that. But I will show you, uh, even if someone trying to change that, we can still uh, detect uh, what the actual client or server was. So here are a couple examples and use cases of uh, this SSH fingerprinting uh, technique. Uh, you can see the first one is NCRAC. So uh, in NCRAC, you can customize the uh, SSH identification string that I told you just uh, right now. But uh, it doesn't matter if you change it to open SSH or anything else. Uh, you always have this specific hash because of the uh, order of encryption algorithms and everything in uh, NCRAC library. Uh, another interesting thing uh, which I found uh, several months ago was that Cobalt Strike also has a, a SSH client built in and uh, there's no way you can change that uh, built in SSH client. So I had a look at that uh, and uh, apparently it has a specific uh, SSH fingerprint. 
So if you uh, search for this SSH fingerprint inside your network from Windows systems to Linux systems, that's uh, like certainly something like Cobalt Strike. I actually tested that and it actually doesn't have any false positive. And then uh, the last one here in the examples is the Cowrie Honeypot. So you know that in honeypots we try to fake a specific uh, protocol or server or something. And uh, here in Cowrie, which is a SSH honeypot, uh, you can customize that a string which uh, tells the attacker, for example, I'm open SSH or something. But uh, if you have a look at the hash, uh, it actually uses a static list of uh, encryption algorithms and compression and case, all those stuff. And that actually results in a unique uh, hash. If you start uh, searching this in Census or Shodan, you can find many uh, SSH honeypots out there and it's kind of interesting. And uh, the last thing about uh, the SSH uh, fingerprinting thing here is uh, a, a simple tool I created called uh, HashGen. Uh, because the problem with uh, TLS was uh, Fujatri, uh, I know many uh, people and companies out there was looking for a, a database of uh, Jotri fingerprints to use for detection or baselining. Uh, but it's a bit hard to automate creating that. So I created this hash gen. Actually, there is another version for uh, Jotri as well, which I haven't uh, released yet. I'll probably do, do it soon. So what hash gen does is, it's actually a simple Python script and also a Docker file, which will be modified by the Python script dynamically. So it uh, starts uh, changing the Docker file and using different operating systems with different uh, OpenSSL versions and uh, then tries to initiate a connection and captures the hash value. So here you can uh, automate the creation of this database for yourself. Okay, let's uh, move on to another interesting protocol here, which is uh, RDP. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussions around it uh, during the past couple of days. So I thought, uh, why not uh, including that in uh, this presentation? So I've been working on uh, capturing the RDP traffic on my honeypots uh, from uh, several months ago, but uh, started looking at that uh, more closely from a couple of days ago. So let's see how we can actually fingerprint the RDP connections. Uh, before we start uh, doing that, we need to learn more about the RDP itself. We need to know how RDP works and uh, is it using uh, TLS or is it like using something else. So it actually uses TLS and also another uh, protocol which is the RDP's standard security protocol. So uh, I will show you in the next couple of slides uh, how we can fingerprint the RDP connections. So the first uh, RDP connection we have is the negotiation request. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use TLS or standard RDP security protocol, you always have these uh, negotiation request, and in the negotiation request, there is a requested protocols field. And uh, here you can see that uh, the protocols here is set by the client. What we have here in the screenshot is TLS, CRED SSP, and EUI, EUA. So client actually uh, tells the server that I support these protocols. Then the server selects one and continues the connection. So the thing is, if uh, the client uses, client or server uses the enhanced RDP security, uh, which can be TLS uh, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, CRED SSP, or uh, RDS TLS, uh, they actually use TLS, and that's good. So we can still fingerprint these connections using JAW3. Uh, but if it uses uh, the standard RDP security, uh, it's actually even better because uh, then we have other list of uh, parameters we can use for fingerprinting. So I will show you here uh, an experimental fingerprint method I created for standard uh, RDP security. Uh, again, I say this is not perfect. It, it's uh, just for my use case. 
Um, I will probably work on uh, completing that and uh, finalizing that in the coming weeks. But the current composition is a major version, minor version, uh, cluster flags, encryption methods, uh, X encryption methods, and channel depth. So the thing is, uh, here you can see in the screenshot that if we use RDP standard security, we have another uh, message, which is a uh, client data. So after that uh, initial negotiation, we have the client data. And in client data, we have uh, many interesting fields, uh, which shows what RDP client uh, is used for this connection. So, I will go back to that in the observation section of this uh, presentation. But uh, now let's uh, have a look at other protocols and see if we can start uh, the fingerprinting those as well. So for HTTP, actually, there is a great work uh, by NetSquare guys uh, back in uh, 2003. Uh, this is actually for uh, fingerprinting HTTP servers, but the same uh, approach can be applied to HTTP clients as well. There are several things you can use, but the uh, the most interesting one is uh, the order of HTTP headers. So this is something uh, for HTTP. Then uh, the recent work I started doing is on Quick Protocol, uh, which actually has uh, two main versions, Google Quick and IETF version. So uh, recently I started uh, creating a Go-based library for Quick for extracting the uh, Quick client hellos, and uh, you can see here is a sample screenshot of that. Uh, I'm continuing uh, working on that to support IETF version as well. Uh, but uh, what other protocols can be uh, fingerprinted this way? Basically, any cryptographic protocols having a clear text uh, negotiation, and uh, even non-cryptographic protocols like HTTP, as I told you, the order of um, headers or some other uh, features can be used for fingerprinting. So why we should do that? How these fingerprinting and metadata can help us uh, identifying the attackers' tools and profiling them? So the problem is the current honeypots uh, has limited network logging and they usually log just uh, general network information and some uh, application level data. Like, for example, in carry, you have SSH commands. Uh, you have uh, some authentication uh, related logs and stuff like that. Uh, the same thing uh, for RDP honeypots and other honeypots out there. But uh, there are no network metadata and handshake logging. So, and, and actually that's the reason why all the research we see, almost all the research we see out there about the honeypots, they're mostly about uh, like the number of connections to different ports and the uh, scanning trends and stuff like that, but not, nothing uh, interesting other than that. So my main question was, if we log uh, handshakes and network metadata, could we find anything else, some um, other interesting stuff, which I told you at the uh, beginning of my presentation? So let's uh, have a look at what, uh, what are our options for logging the network metadata. So Bro or Zeek is one of the best uh, things we can use for that. It's actually a pretty mature uh, tool and uh, it's really flexible. But the problem with Bro is if you want to add a new uh, protocol like, uh, for example, Quick, or if you want to extract new fields from RDP, it's a bit hard, like I won't do that. Uh, Another one is Suricata. So Suricata is a bit easier uh, for expanding and adding new protocols, but currently uh, supports HTTP, DNS, and TLS. Uh, it's good for uh, collecting network metadata in production, but it doesn't work for my, my use case. And then uh, there's T-Shark, which is actually what I used, because uh, maybe it's a bit weird, because like, uh, T-Shark isn't good for like uh, collecting uh, network logs in production, but it actually works uh, for my use case. I will show you. 
And then uh, there's another tool which is released uh, recently, which is based on Go. And uh, it's actually uh, pretty good. I haven't tested it, but it's one of the best tools out there, which is Netcap. So this is actually the first version of my research which I presented last year in the HoneyNet project. Uh, it was mainly focused on TLS. Uh, so what I used there for monitoring was Bro uh, and Jaw3 script. And uh, for the HoneyPot, I just used an Nginx, nothing special, just an Nginx with some open uh, TLS ports. And then I joined uh, that Nginx logs with uh, bro logs and uh, like created this dashboard and uh, some uh, context around the connections I was seeing. So this year I changed that a bit. Uh, instead of uh, bro, I started using my own tool uh, which released a couple of days ago called FAT, fingerprinting all the things. So it's actually based on T-Shark. It uses uh, the Python's uh, wrapper for T-Shark. And uh, the reason I actually used that was because I wanted to log different new protocols like uh, Quick, RDP, and I wanted to have a way to quickly uh, create an experimental uh, fingerprinting, uh, the same thing as I uh, showed you for RDP, RDFP. So uh, this was, I guess, the best choice for that. And for the honeypot part, I used, again, Nginx for TLS and HTTP ports, uh, RDP for RDP, and Caddy, which is a web server for Quick. So then I collected the logs using FluentD, MongoDB, and Metabase. Uh, it doesn't matter what you use. This is just uh, what I wanted to share. So let's uh, have a look at this uh, new tool and see how we can use that for our research. So this is actually, if you want to, uh, this is the link uh, you can use. And if you scan this uh, QR code, you go to the GitHub page. Uh, as I told you, it's a PyShark-based Py script uh, for extracting network metadata and fingerprints for, uh, currently it just supports TLS, SSH, RDP, HTTP, and GQuick. Um, I'm adding an IETF version of Quick, uh, MySQL, MSSQL as well. Uh, so my main use case uh, is, was for monitoring honeypots and network forensic, but yeah, it's up to you. You can use it for different things. Uh, easy to add new protocols. The JSON output is uh, good. You can uh, just import it into your Splunk or any other tools you use for uh, log management and analysis. And uh, maybe the only downside is the performance because it's based on T-Shark, so it's not really uh, like high performance, and that's the reason I started uh, creating a version in Go using the Go packet as well. So that's uh, still under development. So here's a sample log uh, from FAT, and uh, as you can see here, this is uh, uh, listening uh, to the network connections in live mode and just uh, prints some uh, a summarized version of the connections and also log that into a JSON file. So now the most interesting, at least uh, I think it's the most interesting uh, part of the talk, which is the observations. Uh, now let's see what we can understand about the attackers and tools using these metadata and the fingerprints. So this is just a just simple diagram you can see here. The interesting thing here is that you can see an actor started uh, scanning some TLS ports like 992, 443, and other ports. And uh, the interesting thing here is he or she actually scanned all these ports uh, 54 times. Like you can see the graph is really cool and uh, it shows that a specific actor. But this is Simple thing you can see in other honeypot uh, research as well, but let's see what other things we can have. So I started uh, visualizing the logs and uh, I used IP source as the 
as one node and Jotri as the other and connected these two together. So this is uh, what I saw. I didn't really expect to see this. So if you look closer, let me zoom into that. So here you can see some interesting stuff. Like this is something uh, we actually expect to see. Uh, different IPs connecting to one specific jaw tree. That's normal because they use uh, the same tool like Google Chrome or Nmap or something. And this is kind of normal things we should see. But have a look at this or this one here or this one. So these are the normal things I showed you. I'll skip that and go to the interesting one. So what you see here is that there are like 10 IP addresses with more than uh, 500 different jaw trees. Uh, this is a bit weird. I actually selected one of the IPs and you can see uh, just one of these IPs has about uh, 500 jaw tree values. So let's look at it uh, a bit closer and see what's the reason for that. So this is actually an attempt to avoid SSL fingerprinting by randomizing client flow uh, client hello fields. Uh, I first actually ident identified this at uh, late 2017 and reported in uh, July 2018 last year in the Honeynet project. But uh, recently, uh, some researchers from Akame also started uh, observing these and reported that actually several days ago. And uh, yeah, this is just a pointer to that just for record. So let's have a look at that. So here's one of the uh, TLS fingerprinting evasion attempts. You can see here the jaw tree feels is a bit weird. It's too short. This is the same, uh, like, let me, so can you see here the uh, jaw trees? Jaw trees are the same, IP sources are different, and jaw tree fields are a bit weird. You can see that here again. So. If you look closer, you see that uh, these numbers are changing. Uh, actually, if you sort that, you can see that it starts from one, going to two, three, four, five, and uh, increases. This is another one, which uh, you can see here. There's an IP source, again, with lots of jaw trees. And, uh, Again, when we look uh, closer, here's actually a more interesting pattern. Can you see the pattern here? This is another one from the same actor. So if you have a look at this pattern, like these numbers I highlighted will be removed in the next packet. Like have a look at this one, 61 will be removed in the next one. 53 will be removed in the next one, 156, and 60 from the next one. So the pattern is like so obvious when you have a look at that uh, jaw tree fields. These are two other uh, samples here, which you can see again from the same actor. So this one is actually my favorite one. It's actually kind of interesting. You can see four different clusters here, and they're all connected together with some links here. So the IPs are completely different, jaw tree is different, but because of these nodes here, we can connect these four clusters together, which is interesting. So the pattern in this one is even more interesting than the, before, the previous one. So here you can see the, the green box, there's something, then something else, then again the first one repeated uh, five or six times, 
and then in a small one, which is actually an invalid uh, cipher, and then a wall of text. So this actually happens every time for the same actor I've observed. And the interesting thing is, uh, when you have a look at these values, it's actually different every time, but the pattern is the same. Like, have a look at the next one. The values are completely different this time, but the pattern is the same. Something, then something else, then the first thing happened five or six times, then that invalid thing, and then the wall of text. So it's actually interesting. We can identify that actor always using this pattern. Uh, just a few other things, and then uh, I'll show you something on RDP. So for profiling the tools and actors, you can see here, because of some links between these uh, graphs, you can profile the tools and actors, actually. You can understand that this is the same actor uh, using the same tools because, for example, in this example here, you, you see like the IPs are different, but just because of this uh, jaw tree here, we can connect these two IPs together. There's also a uh, Tor exit node monitoring as well, which you can see these IPs here are completely different, but the jaw trees here can connect these IPs together, which means that this is the same actor using the same tool. Let's have a look at some observations on RDP. So in RDP, I've started seeing these connections which shows some randomized cookie string. Another interesting thing here is the requested protocols is empty, uh, which isn't a normal thing. And then here the fingerprint, which I told you is an experimental fingerprint, shows that uh, all these random cookie strings has uh, four specific fingerprints each time. And this is because the actor started uh, changing the uh, encryption algorithm is used. This is another one which you can see. Uh, you actually can't see the source IPs, but the source IPs are different. Uh, RDFP or fingerprint is the same. And here, the cookie is uh, like something like a brute force. And the last thing in the RDP is uh, the jaw tree of RDP scanner. So the previous thing I showed you was uh, actually the scanners using the standard RDP security protocol. But this is uh, the ones which are using the TLS. And uh, this is the jaw tree of those things. I wish I had like more time to go through these. There was lots of uh, uh, diagrams and stuff to show you. But I will finish that with uh, another observation from SSH. Uh, the same thing happens here in SSH as well. You can see here uh, there are different uh, client strings, which is randomized, but all has the same hash value, which is the hash value of Golang, uh, the SSH library which is actually for a, a malware using Go. This is actually just uh, the only current thing that I see in Quick, which is uh, just one actor scanning my uh, Quick honeypot every day with this uh, user agent, which isn't a valid user agent for uh, Google Chrome. I probably uh, provide more details and graphs and uh, I'm also going to release the data set, if you're interested, uh, soon after the talk. But uh, just uh, to conclude the talk, you saw that uh, with capturing network metadata and fingerprints, we can identify different actors and tools and profile them, discover new connections between the actors which we couldn't find before using metadata and fingerprint, and finally detecting evasion, evasion techniques that um, you saw in the talk. So, I guess I don't have enough time anymore. If you have any questions. That was absolutely fantastic. I love listening to uh, people speak that are highly passionate about what they do. And that's a really, really good tool. Um, we're just talking about it before and he says, I can talk about this for hours. So um, if you do have any questions, please um, meet him outside. But um, let's thank Adele.